The best minds of Byzantium watched with sorrow as the empire gradually died, but no one heeded their warnings. The high-profile statesman, Theodor Metohit, who saw no salvation for Byzantium, wept over the former greatness of the Romans and their perished happiness. He lamented the empire wasted by illnesses, easily succumbing to every attack by its neighbors, and become the helpless victim of fate and eventuality. A new union, signed in Florence, in what was now a completely mad hope for help from the West, did not change a thing. For the Byzantines themselves, this was a new moral blow of great magnitude. Now not only the emperor, but even the holy patriarch shared the faith of the Latins. However, despite various hierarchs betrayals, the Orthodox Church stood firm. All were against the Union, a Byzantine historian relates. O oh, piteous Romans, monk Gennadios Scolarios wrote prophetically from his reclusion after the signing of the Florentine Union and 14 years before the fall of Constantinople. Why have you gone astray from the right path? You have departed from the hope in God and begun to hope in the might of the Franks. Together with the city in which everything will soon be destroyed, have you apostatized from your piety? Be merciful to me, O Lord. I witness before the face of God that I am not guilty of this. Return, wretched citizens, and think about what you are doing. Together with the captivity which will soon befall us, you have apostatized from your father's inheritance and begun to confess dishonor. Woe to you when God's judgment shall come upon you. The words of Gennadius Scolarius came true to the letter, and he himself was to carry the unbearably heavy cross of a bitter patriarchate. He became the first Orthodox patriarch in Constantinople after its fall to the Turks. The fatal year of 1453 was approaching. In April, Sultan Mehmed, still a very young man of 21, about the age of a college sophomore in today's Istanbul, attacked Constantinople. The Sultan was absolutely delirious with the idea of taking the Romans' capital. His elder counselors, viziers, one of whom was a secret agent from Byzantium, persuaded him to cancel the attack, saying that it was too dangerous to battle on two fronts, for all were certain that battalions from Genoa and Venice would arrive any minute. But the Sultan turned out to be a disobedient pupil. The promised help from Europe, of course, did not arrive. To the party of westernizers in Constantinople, there was also added a pro-Turkish party. Sad as it may be, there was no true Byzantine imperial party amongst the politicians. The Turkish party was headed by the first minister and admiral, Grand Duke Notaras. He announced for all to hear that it would be better to see the Turkish Chalma cap ruling in the city than the Latin tiara. A little later, he, the first minister, was to fully experience just what this ruling Turkish Chalma cap was actually like. When Sultan Mehmed II took the city, amidst the general pillage and wild mayhem, he decided to appoint this very notaris as head of the city. However, when he learned that the Grand Duke had a 14-year-old son of rare beauty, he demanded that the son be first surrendered to his harem of boys. When the Sheikh and Notaris refused, the Sultan commanded that both he and the boy be beheaded. The terrible outcome was unfolding inescapably. 
O Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasury of good gifts and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us of all impurity and save our souls, O Good One. May 29, 1453, after a siege lasting many months and resisted heroically by the city's defense forces, the Turks were able to break through the upper wall. The defense forces, frightened, turned to flight. The last Byzantine emperor, Constantine Paleologus, remained alone, abandoned by all. Holding his sword and shield, the emperor exclaimed, Is there not a Christian who might take off my head? But there was no one to answer. The enemy surrounded him, and after a brief siege, the Turks standing behind the sovereign killed him with a knife in the back.